Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron. This is Scott. This is Tucker. And today we're covering the topic of hell. Okay, so today the topic that we're going to be looking at in this episode is hell. Um, hell's never uh, something that I guess anybody really enjoys talking about. I guess in the sense of like, I, I'm not, I don't like avoid talking about it because I think it's important, right? You know, it's like, you know, it's like you have this, I'm trying to think like cancer, right? Like I wouldn't avoid talking about it if it needs to be talked about because you need yeah. to know that you're sick. So you have the motivation for the cure. Yeah. It's like you go to see the doctor. I don't, the doctor, I don't really like talking about cancer. I'm just not going to mention that to my patient. Yeah. That'd be a bad doctor yeah. because it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, nobody it's likes terrible. to hear. Nobody would like to hear that they have cancer, cancer. or some no, other illness. It's bad yeah. news. It's but, bad news, but you need to know the bad news. So, you know, so you're like, have your motivation for the good news. It's like with, you know, people need to know they're lost before they want to be saved. Most people, I think one of the problems is most people are like, <laughs> I don't understand why this person doesn't want to be saved. It's like, well, do they know that they're lost? Yeah. Like nobody goes and looks in the lost and found for their car keys Amen. until they go to look for the car keys and they're lost. I know? didn't know that I had a kidney infection recently. Right. Yeah. But when they told me, Hey, you got a kidney infection and we're going to have to put you in for a, a few days. I mean, that's better than them not telling me. Yeah. That's better than saying, here's two Advil. Well, if they, just, use a heating okay, if they just came to you, you and know? said, Scott, you need to come to the hospital for a few yeah. days. You'd be like, no, I don't. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why would I need to come? Oh, yeah. you have a kidney infection. Oh, yeah. of course, in your case, you knew you had something wrong. It's still it was painful, not but good news, but you know what? It's better than that's right. not knowing. It's better than doing nothing about it. That's right. It's, you know, yeah. it's bad stuff. Yeah. You ignore that kind of thing. Yeah. Same so with this though. Yeah. So in this episode, we're going to talk about hell <coughs> and it's uncomfortable for some people, but you need to hear about it. I mean, you know, why should we talk about it? Well, who, who else talked about it in scripture? Jesus. Jesus. He yeah. talked about it a lot. Yeah. I think, um, I think of the 12 times it's mentioned and I'll, I'll give some clarifying information in case somebody's like, well, I read my, you know, Bible and I see the word hell a lot more. Right. But I think the, the word hell Gehenna, which we'll talk about what the origin of that word is. Um, is maybe 12 times. And I think 11 of the 12 times Jesus says it. And then of course in James, I think it's James three. I don't know what verse I don't, I don't I'll think of it in a little bit, but it's where it talks about the tongue is set on fire by hell. Right. Yeah. So Jesus talked about it a lot, 11 times. So let's go ahead and talk. Okay. So first of all, um, let's talk about the word hell in your English Bible. So if you have like a King James, the word hell is in there about 23 times. Um, but this can be a little confusing. It's three different Greek words. Mm -hmm. The King James translated as hell. So the three words are Hades, which is the, <laughs> the like, for instance, I, I use the new King James. Mm -hmm. And so like one of the things the new King James updated from the King James is it changed all the, the, the Greek where the Greek word Hades was and King James had hell. It changed it to Hades. And I think that's, that's accurate. That's a good correction because the word Hades basically means the unseen realm, right? It's basically, if you think about the Bible in Luke 16, remember you had the story of the rich man. I say story, it's an yeah. account. Sometimes I use the word story and people say, you know, you said it's a story. I'm like, well, yeah, it's a true story. I think it's true. It is true. Yeah, yeah, of course it's true. So sometimes whenever I've used the word story, people have said, you know, you said story, not account. I'm like, they're the same thing. It's yeah. a true story, right? I didn't say fiction, right? So it's a the story or the true account of rich man and Lazarus and whenever they die, where, where does each one of them go? The rich man goes to torment. Okay. The poor man goes to paradise or Abraham's bosom. That's right. Right. Yes. Abraham's bosom, which is a section of Hades. So yeah. Hades has two realms. The good part, which is the part you want to go to when you die, which is Abraham's bosom or paradise. And you have a place of torment. Right now, if you remember the thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, paradise. So when Jesus died and the thief died, they were in paradise yeah. until the resurrection, until Jesus resurrected. Right. Yeah. So that's the one, the word that the King James translates as hell. Other translations do, I think, a better job. I love the King James, but just in this word, I, it's 10 times, I think, in the King James as hell it should have been Hades. Right. And Luke 16 is a place of torment for the rich man and Lazarus is in paradise, which is where a thief on the cross was, right? Then you have one time, go to second Peter chapter two and verse four, second Peter chapter two and verse four, you have a word called uh, it's Tartarus or Tartaru, I think is maybe the Greek, but Tartarus is a place that 
read Second Peter two four. Do you have it, Tucker? Yeah. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Okay. So once again, this is even the New King James, which I just got done praising it about the word Hades, and it says, uh, "Cast them down to hell." Well, that's the word Tartarus, right? And so if you look at Greek lexicons, which is just a Greek dex- dictionary, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like one of them that I, a couple that I use, one of them, the Lexham Theological Word Book says, in classical Greek, this verb, tartaru, which is here, describes the act of holding a prisoner in Tartarus, the level of Hades where the wicked are punished, right? So this seems to be the place in Luke 16 where the rich man went, where he was in torment. It's a different word. It's not the word Tartarus, but um, so the place of Hades, the waiting place until the resurrection, right, is the bad place, which is Tartarus. So, yeah. um, that seems to be what is being referred to in Second Peter two four. Now, the word that we're going to focus most of our time on is the word Gehenna. Okay, and so that's twelve times in the New Testament. We said eleven of the twelve. Jesus, uh, James one six, not James three. James one yeah, six. I was wondering if you meant that. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that right, James one six? Let me look it up. Well, while you're doing that, for I'm some just... reason, I thought it was in chapter three where it talks about the tongue. It is three five. So it's three five. So I don't know why I have one six. So okay, three five is uh. Yeah, three five is where Gehenna is used by James. But of those eleven other times, Gehenna is used. All right. Yeah. So let's look up some old pa- Old Testament passages, right? Because Gehenna has a history, right? And so um, the the word Gehenna comes from the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. Okay. Go, Tucker. Look up Joshua fifteen eight. Okay. Scott, can you look up Second Chronicles twenty eight three? All right. Okay. So you read Joshua fifteen eight, Tucker, and the border went up by the valley of the sun and Hinnom to the southern slope of the Jesubite city, which is Jerusalem. The border went up to the top of the mountain that lies before the valley of Hinnom westward, which is at the end of the valley of Raphan. I don't know. Pronounce that That's right. fine. Northward. You're fine. Yeah, north. You're fine. Northern. So it's basically a ravine that's uh, outside of Jerusalem, right? I think I think it might. The ravine might be. Oh, I'm not going to give a direction. So, But the ravine is outside of Jerusalem, right? Now, this is what happened in that valley. Read Second Chronicles 28.3, Scott. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Let's talk about Ahaz, right? Ahaz was a king, an evil king, but listen to what he did. And burned his children in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So this is talking about Ahaz, and it talks about how Ahaz had burned incense in the valley of the sons of Hinnom and burned his children in the fire. Mm. So this is some of the wicked things that... You know, basically the reason that God cast out the Canaanites from Canaan, land of Canaan, and all those other people, right, is because they did these wicked things like burn their children to these false gods, right, to the idols. And then guess what God's people do? They do the exact same thing. Um, you're in Second Chronicles. Can you read 33, 6? This is yeah. talking about Manasseh. So we're talking about what happened in the valley of the sons of Hinnom. This is a valley, a, a ravine right outside of Jerusalem. Also, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritist. Or spiritist. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It does continue. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So that's Manasseh. So the, the word Gehenna is a reference to the valley of the sons of Hinnom which Joshua 15, 8, you read. Mm-hmm. Scott read the two passages in Second Chronicles where it talks about what happened there. They were burning children, right? There was this right. horrible sacrifice, right? Now, when Manasseh's son, I think it's Manasseh's son, Josiah becomes king. Is that right? Manasseh yeah. and then Josiah, yeah. Yep. Um, read Second Kings 23.10. And he defiled Toth, uh, if I'm saying yeah, that that's right, uh, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Okay, so we talked about this in a previous episode. Manasseh, his father, is passing children, his own sons, through the fire to these false gods, Molech. And then whenever Josiah, his son, becomes king, he says, I'm going to destroy, I'm defiling this place because my brother, I don't know that he said that, but my brother was sacrificed there along with all these other babies, right? So this is all stuff that happened in (coughs) this valley, right? And so when Josiah defiled it, Josiah basically turned into a garbage dump because of all the evil that had been done there. And so basically they would dump their garbage and it was always burning, right? Continually burning. It was like, okay, when I go to Africa and and I land in Nairobi or like in Western part of Africa, Kasumu, or the couple of times I've flown to Uganda, one thing that they do there is they burn garbage. Like they don't, like here, when I have, you know, if I'm remodeling a bathroom recently, I take drywall and, you know, backer board and I'm taking it and I take it to a, a dumpster and they bury it, right? In Africa, they burn it. 
So when I get off a plane, I can just smell the garbage burning a lot of mm. times, right? So I can imagine outside Jerusalem, there's this valley is always burning. It's got to be a unique smell. Yeah. So when you, it is, yeah, you recognize it. Yeah. But so whenever you get off, uh, whenever you would like get outside the city of Jerusalem, probably in the city, what, and you're near this valley, what do you do? You smell, it's always burning, right? Yeah. And so Jesus takes this picture of this valley and says, hey, I'm going to use this picture of something that's always burning forever, you know, to you people. And I'm going to use this as a, a symbol of what's going to happen eternally for this punishment, right? Which is going to be hell. So some people will say, well, the word Gehenna, you know, they'll explain the history we just said and said, see, it's not a real place. It's just figurative. It's like, no, it's a real place. God just used this picture to tell people, hey, this is what it's going to be. It's not just going to be a place of physical torment, but spiritual torment, right? And so it's not just this place on earth. It's a valley outside of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. but it's going to be this place where spiritually people are, and we're going to talk more about that as we go through the verses, but that's sort of the background of the word mm -hmm. Gehenna. Um, so, okay. What, what is the, um, what's the purpose of hell? Cause some people say, why, why would God do this? What, what is the purpose of hell according to scripture? Well, Jude six. Okay. And the you angels, yeah. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Um, okay. So angels that didn't yeah. keep their proper domain, heaven, yeah. they left their own abode, but they had free will too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, but God said, I'm going to give you free will. You get to do what you want to do. They're cast down and he's reserved in everlasting chains under mm -hmm. darkness for the judgment of the great day. I mean, same kind of parallel with second Peter two, four, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So hell was a place made or, yeah. um, or torment or, well, I guess it'd be hell. Yeah. It'd be eventually. Yeah, though. exactly. Um, that is something in culture. You just think, well, someone said went to heaven. Yeah. And, you know, went to a few years ago when I started learning about torment and paradise. But anyways, yeah. Hell is a, the, ever, the uh, ending place of yeah. where Satan originally and his angels who uh, turned against God, it was made for them. Yeah. Now, and like we said at the beginning, so Jude 6 and 2 Peter 4, um, talking about the angel sin and being cast down. And so they're currently, like in 2 Peter 2, 4, let me open up my Bible. Um, let's see, condemn them. Let's see. Uh, if God did not spare the angels, but cast them down to hell and deliver them chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Uh, I think it's verse nine. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, reserve the unjust under punishment. That's present tense. So a lot of people think, Hey, look, some of those angels are presently being punished, but that's the word Tartarus, which is like you said, it's Hades. But then go to Matthew 25, 41. Because Matthew 25, 41 tells who the devil, like what, what was the purpose of it? Matthew 25, 41, when you guys read it. And he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and its angels. So hell was prepared for who? The devil and his angels. The devil and his angels. But yeah. also, yeah. if People. you don't live a life following, you know, Wayne Jackson, I always talk to people, I'm like, man, you Wayne Jackson, your best friends? Like I wish, you know, but, but um. He had an article about hell that we'll put in the podcast resource page. And he said something like, follow Jesus or go to hell. And then in the very first line, he said, you know, I, I probably could have chose a different title that would have sounded better. He's like, but I wanted to be un, I, wa I wanted to be extremely clear and plain with this article, which is like, you know, people say this sounds narrow minded. Yeah, yeah, it does. But that's okay. <laughs> because that's what the Bible says. It says that mm -hmm. Jesus is the only savior. Yeah. And then if you're not following Jesus, you're, you're not going to go to heaven. And so the only alternative is to be lost, right? And we don't, we don't enjoy that. Mm -hmm. You know, God, 2 Peter 3, 9 and 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, God wants all men to be saved. He wants all men to come to repentance, right? Yeah. And so sometimes you have to be super plain. That's it. Narrow you just is have the to, way. That's right. Is the gate. That's right. So Matthew 25, 41 says that the everlasting fire, speaking of hell, was prepared for the devil and his angels, right? So when we think about hell, we're going to talk about some of the characteristics, but, you know, like... You, we, man, what episode was it? We talked about hell and you made, I said, the devil is not the manager at hotel hell. And you talked about vices. Like you said, it's better yeah. to, uh, that phrase, you know, I think everybody's heard it at some point. What's it go like? Better or, to rule in hell with the devil than serve in heaven. That's what it is. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Something yeah. Cause like people have this idea that like the devil is like leading, he's in charge of hell. Yeah. You know, like you show up to hell and the devil's in charge. 
Yeah, like he just says what goes. And yeah. You can, you can make buddy-buddy with him if you want to. Yeah, like if you're buddies with the devil, then hell's going to be a good time. It's like yeah. that. And you know what? If I'm the devil, that's what I want you to think. I want you to think, look, heaven is for people that love God. But if you end up in, if you end up in hell, it's going to be like not maybe not as good as heaven. But if you enjoy sin, then hell's going to be a nice place because you and the devil are going to get to party together. It's like, no, that's not. That's what no. the devil would want you to believe. But that's not at all what the scriptures say. The scriptures talk about hell is created for a place for the devil to be punished. Like you think about how powerful angels are, right? Like how strong and mighty they are. And this hell is created to punish them. Like if hell is created to punish them, how do you think a human's going to, a human's soul is going to do there? Yeah. yeah it's not going to be good. I mean, no, I, there's no, there's not even any, any reason to think that you're going to be talking to other people. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. let alone talking to the devil. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea, I don't know. I know I've seen movies that talk, try to portray it that way and things in the past. It, 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 it's just not, what do we see in scripture? The little bit that we do see of someone who's at least in torment, mm -hmm. it seems like he's by himself. Yeah. It's, I mean, you at least don't hear them mention the others. Yeah. And he's just crying out in agony and he just wants a drop of water on his tongue. Yeah. And that's it. And then there's no hope. Yeah. Well, and think about, you know, what makes, okay, if the devil's sole purpose on earth is to destroy men, right? Destroy men and their souls. What yeah. makes you think that if you did get to sit right next to him in hell, that he wouldn't be trying to tear you apart then too? Yeah. Why wouldn't he? Why because, would he try to I mean, destroy you now? But then in hell, I'll tell you what, I don't, I think that hell's going to be bad enough for the devil. It's prepared to torment him forever Yeah, that he's not going to have time to worry about messing with you. He's going to be in such utter pain. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's lots of details we don't know about hell, but it's, we, you know, what we do know we can look at scripture. Yeah. And see what the New Testament says. That's what I'm saying. About it, hell, it has certain descriptions, whether they become literal or not. Yeah, it gives you an idea of what it's going to be like. So, well, let's look at them. Yeah, um, I guess you know we have a list here that we put together before. Um, take a pick. You guys just go through. We have a whole list, and we got the same list. So I'll let you guys grab which one you want, and then I'll grab one and just go. All right. Well, let's start off with the first one here, Matthew. Okay. Uh, well, no, that's not it, is it? You guys pick whatever you 30. want. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, I know what I want. You go ahead. You, you go. Okay. I want Matthew 312 first um, because Matthew 312 uh, is speaking. It says his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn. So when you would th like thresh wheat, right, you would keep the good part and get rid of the bad part. Mm -hmm. And so it says he'll gather his wheat into the barn. Then he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And I think it's cool that word unquenchable there is asbestos. You ever know like if you're doing like DIY at your house and you pull up tile yeah. and you're like, what year was this house built? Before 70s? Oh, I have to watch out for asbestos, which causes lung cancer, right? Mm. Well, they used asbestos because it's not flammable. That's why they used it in buildings, right? Mm. And then later they found out, hey, this stuff causes lung cancer, right? So um, the Greek word asbestos is means unquenchable. So that's why they, that's what, that's what got the name. Like it doesn't burn, which is good for fire, but not good for your lungs. I'm going to have to look for that in my house now. Yeah. What house, years your house built? Sixties. All right. Well, before we start tearing stuff up, <laughs> let me know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You should, it should be in your disclosure, right? But uh, you never know. Well, if it's before seventies, it sort of assumed that it's possible as best as even after that, because they manufactured it anyway. But anyway. Um, so anyway, unquenchable fire, fire yeah. that's going to be what? Never, Quenched. Never, never quenched. Never quenched. Never put out. There's lots of, there's lots of ideas about hell. There's this real popular idea that it's like annihilation. Like we'll talk about that a little bit more in the notes later, yeah. but this idea that like, oh, well, um, it, you know, humans, like they're going to die, but after a certain amount of time, then the torment's going to be over and they're going to be like just annihilated. Yeah. I mean, the fire is going to be unquenchable, right? It's never going to end. Okay. What were some of the verses you guys got? Oh, uh, I mean, says the same phrase, but adds on the phrase, uh, where? Worm what? does not die in Mark 9, okay. 44, okay. And following, 42, maybe. It depends on where you want to start. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just adds that extra description. Their worm does not die. And I mean, there's been mm -hmm. talk about what does that mean exactly? Is it mm -hmm. talking about the person never dying or are they experiencing worms or whatever? But mm -hmm. either way, it's another description of something that you don't want to, you don't want to feel. Yeah. So yeah. burning fire that never ends where the worm doesn't die. Add another thing to it. Yeah. What is it? What did you, what's your verse? Um, Matthew 5, 29 through 30. If your right hand causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish 
than for your whole body to be cast in hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you for it's more profitable for you than one of your members of your body to be per- to perish than for your whole body to be cast in hell. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's talking about the importance of, or the weight of sin. Like don't, if you're doing something in your, in your life, get rid of it. It's, it's better to get rid of maybe this small thing that you're doing that's causing you to sin than to it ultimately to end up being cast to hell and being away from God forever and to burn forever. Yeah. Which that verse also, once again, shows that when you die, you're not annihilated because if so, why would Jesus waste his time? It's why like would he say like, just burn out? Yeah. Why would he say like, Hey, you know what? If you, uh, if you're going to commit this sin, like, you know, you really should cut it off because as soon as you die, you'll be annihilated. <coughs> right. Now there's honest. different groups that sometimes will say, well, as soon as you die, that's it. Some yeah. say, well, you'll be punished for a certain amount of time and then you're annihilated. Right. There's different ones, but, but wouldn't that make that it be like immediate, right? Because that's like another verse we can add Matthew 13, okay. uh, 49, 50. Okay. Uh, it says the angels will come for us, separated, uh, separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. Right. Which Matthew in the furnace of fire. Matthew 25 30 says, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. So it's like this idea that there's so much pain and there's like utter darkness. There's misery, misery, there's sorrow, s- crying, emptiness. Yeah. And just yeah. dark gnashing of teeth. Like you're in pain, but you can't even see. I mean, yeah. It's like, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's going to be literally pitch black or if it's about spiritual darkness because God's presence isn't there. But it's going to be darkness, like a dark outer dungeon darkness. dungeon with screams of torture while you're burning on fire all over your body. Yeah, it's terrifying. Mm-hmm. It's terrifying. Um, Matthew 10, 28. You, you brought this up in one of the, uh, the other episodes. Do not fear those that kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. So it's basically saying like, if someone says, I'm going to murder you, if you don't renounce Christ, you shouldn't be afraid of that person, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously it's going to be painful, but when you compare it with the weight of eternity, the second part, rather fear him, God, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And sometimes people get that word bought that destroy and say like, see, that means that the soul is going to be destroyed in hell. It's like, no, if you, if you look up what the word means, the Greek word means and look up in lexicons like W.E. Vine, I believe is a like famous lexo- lexicographer. And he said that that word does not mean annihilated there. Um, Thayer is another one that talks about how it means eternal misery. Um, Vine actually said it's not, it's not the, I didn't, I didn't write it down, but it's not like the ceasing of being, it's the ceasing of well being. So he's like, it's not that you're destroyed, but that your well being is just like gone. Like you're going to be punished forever. And Thayer said eternal misery. So, okay, I want to paint a picture. Yeah, I mean, we use that phrase like some teenagers like more popularly yeah. use the phrase, my life is over. You know, yeah, it's it's like they. Yeah, in that case, a little. It's mellow, like your life's not over. But, yeah, it's like it's not over. Sense, it's just it is like everything's life is horrible. Over, but yeah, that yeah. doesn't mean that you have stopped existing. Exactly, exactly. So, um, okay, I want to paint a picture. So, Matthew sixteen twenty seven. Think about this is the second coming, right? So think about the second coming. Matthew sixteen twenty seven. The Son of Man will come in glory, his glory with the Father with the angels. He will reward each according to his works. Please, if you get one thing from this. Get rid of this, I'm trying to think of a nice word, false idea that what you do doesn't matter on this earth. I hear so many people, I'm sorry, that say we're saved by grace through faith, which is true, not of works, which is true. It's talking, I think it's talking about the works of the law of Moses in there because he starts talking about the middle wall partition, et cetera. But we're saved by God's grace through the system of faith. We can't save ourselves. We can't earn or merit salvation. We do have to be obedient to what God says to be saved. But then there are people that say, not of works. And they say, that means nothing you do matters. Give me a break. I'm sorry. Matthew 16, 27. He will reward each according to his what? His works. His works. What you do in this life does matter. You do have to be obedient. Lots of other passages teach that if you're not obedient, if you're disobedient, even as a Christian, Romans 6, 16 and following, you can be lost, right? So don't let anybody convince you this false idea that your works don't matter, right? They don't earn salvation, but they do matter as far as you being obedient and being faithful, right? Someone's going to take this out of context and say, Aaron's teaching work salvation, which I get accused of all the time anyway, but it's not true, okay? We're saved by God's grace through faith, but that faith includes being obedient. Yeah. James 2 talks about yeah. it, all right? So- Just like Abraham. That's right. Just like just like everyone in Hebrews yeah. chapter 11. Yeah. By faith, they did this. By faith, they did this, right? Okay, so Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man, Christ, is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, 
And then what happens? You brought this up, Matthew, uh, Matthew 13, 49 and 50. Read that again. Matthew 13, 49 through 50. 13, 49 and 50. Let me get back to it real quick. Okay. And I'm there. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So Christ returns with his angels. He's going to separate <laughs> the wicked from the just. Okay. The wicked are going to be cast into the furnace of fire. Okay. This is talking about judgment day. People sent to hell. Do you have Mark 838, Tucker? I can. Okay. So imagine judgment day. You're you're there and you're waiting to see if you're going to be separated as a righteous person or an uh, unjust person, a wicked one. And listen to Mark 838. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. So whoever is ashamed of Christ in this world, what does it mean to be ashamed of Christ? Well, deny him. Deny him to yeah, not stand for the him. things that he says Yeah, because something's not popular. Yeah. You know, there's lots to of things that Christ of said. Crowd and like, That's oh, right. Yeah, uh, I can go along with this. Even, you know, non-verbally, you're mm -hmm. just going to go along with whatever is popular and you're going to do it even though, you know, some other day of the week you say, no, I follow Jesus. Yeah. Ro I mean, Romans one thirty two. we looked at that in the previous episode. Not only those that do them, but those that approve of those that do. Right now, and I know when these episodes are releasing, abortion is going to be a big thing in this country. You can be forgiven of abortion. I'm trying to pick on abortion, abortions. But the fact is, like, when someone out there is saying, if you're claiming to be Christian, I would never have one, but I support somebody that does. Yeah. That's Romans 132. Whenever somebody out there says it's not, it's okay, it's not a big deal, and you're a Christian and you sit there and listen to it, that's Romans 132. Like you need to speak up and say, no, 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 that's wrong. Yeah. That is that's what being ashamed of Christ. If you aren't, a, aren't willing to stand up for what He said, that's being ashamed of what He said, right? It's like if I'm stand, if if I'm buddies with you guys and I'm talking to somebody and they start bashing you. What am I supposed to do? Yeah, man. Uh, just sit there and let it happen? Just, no, I'm going to stand up and say, you don't know what you're talking about. I know those guys. I know yeah. that's like going off a little bit, but that just brings to mind uh, the night, you know, Christ was being held in the trial and Peter's there. Mm -hmm. Adds that much more to the betrayal, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So next passage, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. Yeah. Think about this is what happens, right? let's just hypothetically say you've lived a life of denying him, right? At some point I had, some point you guys had too, right? Mm -hmm. But we're, we're trying to basically say, okay, this is somebody, a hypothetical person, when the angels return, somebody read 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Okay. So number one, look at verse six. It's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. He's writing to the Christians who've been persecuted. And he says, you know what? God thinks it's a righteous thing to repay those who trouble you. Yeah. We think like, oh, for God to punish somebody, I, you know, I can't believe God would do that. God says it's righteous. Yeah. Because a lot of times the people being persecuted, right, are being persecuted by the persecutors. So the persecutors punish the people that are trying to follow God. And God says on judgment day, what's going to happen? I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to flip it. Yeah. The people who've been punishing you, they're going to be the ones that are punished. Yeah. Right. So God says, number one, it's righteous. And then it says, in verse seven, Lord Jesus revealed with his, from heaven, his mighty angels. These are all the passages we've been looking at. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when that day comes, and you don't know when it's going to come, it could come tomorrow, you need to be ready. If it comes tomorrow, you'll never see this episode. But you need to be ready because if you're not one of those that have obeyed the gospel, those who have, that know God, it says what's going to happen. He's going to take vengeance. Yes, and you'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Yeah. Everlasting. I want to look up and see what word that is. You know, <clears throat> if it was know, just like, like I was thinking, that's an interesting phrase. Yeah, yeah, it's the same one. Go to it's go. All you talk about. Uh, go to Matthew twenty five forty six. It's the same Greek word. If it was just like, you go to hell, you get annihilated, then people probably wouldn't care. They'd be like, who cares? Like, I'll just do whatever I want here. I'll go to hell, and then it'll be over. But yeah. if it's everlasting, it's a little different. Yeah, and Matthew twenty. So the word there in Second Thessalonians one six through nine. Let me just double check it one more time. 
Um, everlasting is uh, Ionios. Yeah. yeah. So Matthew 25, 46, read that, Scott. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into ever uh, into eternal life. So I don't know why the translators did. I'm looking at the New King James. Are you looking at the King James? New King James. New King James. What are you looking at right now? Same. Okay. These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So it says punishment is everlasting. In eternal life, the righteous will go into eternal life. That says eternal. So everlasting and eternal. Yeah. But like when I look at the Greek words, eternal, Ionios. Everlasting, Ionios. Hmm. Yeah, same one. Same word. Why, yeah, why did they? Uh, I don't choose? know. I don't maybe know why they, they did maybe, that. Maybe just connotation or something. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, I hadn't got a chance to ask any of the translators, yeah. but everlasting punishment and eternal life. Same word. So whatever heaven is going to be, what's that tell you? Hell's going to be. Hell's going to be, you know, age without end, I think is what Ionios means. So whatever heaven and hell, the same, the the same words used. So it seems like the duration is going to be the same, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's lots of passages that talk about these different things. And ultimately what hell is, it's a complete separation from God, all of his attributes. I mean, uh, man, Eric Owens, I'm going to have to try to find this lesson. I'm going to, I'll find this lesson, I think, and put it in the, um, podcast resource page. Eric Owens did this lesson on what if God took back everything that he has given us? He talked about if he took back all of his grace, if he took back all of his goodness, all of his mercy, all the things that we have on this earth, what would it be like? And I can't remember if he actually said that's what's going to hell's going to be like or not, but that's what hell's going to be. Everything good that we have in this universe that God's given us is going to be gone because we'll be totally separated from God. I see what you mean. You know? Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast has been sponsored by GBN, Gospel Broadcasting Network. You can download the app and start streaming every show, watch every episode, and discover the answers to life's biggest questions today. That's why we wanted to talk about hell, because we need to talk about it because it's the only cure is Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's huge. It's a huge part of why you need salvation, in, in a sense. You need salvation because you sin, but what's the consequence of that sin? Well, it's eternal, everlasting punishment. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's important. It's important to understand it. Without hell, if it was just that you're just going to stay here forever, well, a lot of people think, oh, that sounds pretty good. Mm-hmm. So, really, I mean, it's a major motivation for us wanting to do that. I think that's yeah. right. I think that's okay. People have talked about, is it okay for me to be motivated to be mm-hmm. saved because the alternative is hell. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's what he Jesus, came there yeah. preaching. <laughs> Jesus did that a lot. Them. Jesus like, said, I'm yeah. warning you, yeah. stop and change or you'll go to hell. Why would yeah. you say that? Yeah. yeah. If it wasn't okay for me to be motivated by wanting to avoid that. Yeah. That's a good that's point. That's not where you stop. No. I agree with that. Yeah. You got to add on, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's important. Well, I think of it like my dad, like growing up when I was young, one of the reasons I didn't do certain things because I was afraid my dad would spank me if I did it. Right. Yeah. And that taught me respect for authority. Now, as I'm older, like do, you know, if, if I have a chance, which I can't think of something normally, but if I had a chance now to do something that would embarrass my dad, like could my dad, I mean, my dad wouldn't try to spank me now because I'm a grown man. But at the same time, the, it's like perfect love casts out fear. When you grow in a relationship with somebody, there comes a point where, yeah, you're still like with God. I'm still scared of the punishment. There's lots of things that it, that still is a motivator for me now. But it's also like, look at what he did for me. I don't want to disappoint him, you know. But Jesus definitely said it's okay to, to think about hell as a motivator. Yeah. You know. And not only that, I mean, it's just, I thought you were going this direction. But you yeah. talk about parents and children, that idea of that relationship. When you're little, mm-hmm. you avoid doing things because it's going to get you a butt spanking, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But when you grow up you avoid those things because now you've had the opportunity to learn why you need to avoid that. Yeah. You know, so that can get you through that gap. Yeah. So yeah, it's useful in that sense too. Yeah. Early Christians motivated more by wanting to avoid hell as they learn and grow. Yeah. Then they avoid those actions because they understand how destructive they are. Yeah. And they've developed a real love for the individuals it might harm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so let's end with this question. Uh, why does a loving God send people to hell? Because there's a lot of people that ask that, you know, there's like Bertrand Russell was a big atheist or agnostic. I don't know what he would think he'd call himself an agnostic. You really can't know, 
But, um, and many people use this, you know, well, I, I really don't believe in Jesus or his teachings or God because I can't understand why God, a loving God would send people to hell. Yeah. And there's a lot of answers to that. Mm -hmm. I like the simple one. I do like the simple one. Just look, it's really that you're choosing to go there mm -hmm. because I mean, he literally came here and died, mm -hmm. put his body down in front of you yeah, so that if you wanted to continue, you know, you're metaphorically going to walk mm -hmm. over it. You said that in season one. I did. Yeah, I remember but that. But I like it. It's I do too. That's what I'm saying. I, that's I why I'm saying I like what you said. You, yeah. I could tell as you're explaining it, you're trying to avoid saying what you said in season one. Basically. I don't want to sound cliche. <laughs> no, it's not cliche though. But you're literally, you said in season one, if you go to hell, it will literally be over the dead body of Christ. Yeah. And, you know. Because yeah. he made I a way for you. He, he resurrected, so don't get yeah, too yeah, technical. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, he put himself there and and you've got to trample underfoot the blood of Christ mm -hmm. if you want to walk into the gates of hell. Mm -hmm. I mean it. Mm -hmm. Well, and sometimes I think people will make that statement without thinking about certain things. Like if you're going to look, if you're going to look at hell, you have to look at it from a biblical perspective. I mean, if you look at it from an atheistic or agnostic perspective, you know, well, that's, that's not just, well, where are you getting your sense of justice from? Okay, Why so let's do you say even know what hell is if you didn't learn exactly, it from the Bible. Exactly. So you have to take the full picture. So like I think about this, like, okay, let's hypothetically say I committed murder, right? If I committed murder, do I get are they gonna give me a jury full of other murderers? Hmm. Like if I said, like, okay, jury selection to my attorney, hey, try to pick all murderers. Yeah. Well, they're, of course not. Why? It wouldn't be right. Because you, and you're going to say be biased. Yeah. You're going to say, look, that jury is biased. Like yeah. they've all committed murder. They're going to think, well, you know what? Murder is not that big of a deal because I've committed it. Therefore this guy, yeah, he, he may, he may be guilty, but you, you should go easy on the punishment, right? You don't do that. A jury, the defense or the, uh, the prosecutor would be like, yeah, we're striking all the murderers from the jury. Like you can't even be on a, on a jury if you're a felon, I believe. Yeah. I think that's law. You can't be on a jury if you've committed a felony. Why? Because you'd be biased, right? Obvious reasons. <laughs> obvious reasons. How <laughs> to be obvious. So when you look at passages like Genesis 18, where it says, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Yeah. God is holy. God is not going to look at things, especially sin, the way you look at them. Like we don't think lying is that big of a deal, right? Some You should, if you know what the Bible says. Yeah, people don't. People don't. God hates lying. It's one of the seven things he hates. Like it's an abomination, yeah. Proverbs 6. Yeah, it's like number whatever and number whatever. It's twice. It's <laughs> yeah. in there twice. It's yeah. bearing false witness, which is a lie. Spreading discord among brethren, which could be a lie. Yeah. And a lying tongue. So it's almost in there like three, I believe. Yeah. But two for sure, right? So like God is holy and just and good. But God also says, you know, and another thing, right? If it takes you five seconds to murder somebody, are you going to go to jail for five seconds? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. You could, mur it could, you could murder somebody in a fit of rage, like second degree murder in five seconds, right? And you could spend what? How long in prison? Could spend Realistically, life. Yeah. Yeah. Life. Life. Or yeah, however long it takes. Now, is anybody, is anybody going to say, well, that's, that's not just, you know, he, he killed some guy in five seconds, but he, he shouldn't have spent his whole life. Now, if you're biased, maybe, but most honest people say, no, look, you committed something in that short amount of time that demands punishment for a long time yeah. for your life. Yeah. So now you say, okay, if anybody has the knowledge to make that call of how long somebody should be punished, who would it be? Yeah, it'd, God. Be God. it'd be God. I mean, somebody even, who's outside, holy, righteous, outside of sin. Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, even scripture talked about how God chastens those he loves. Yeah. Like for the purpose of trying to um, redeem us from yeah. our sin too. And so, but yeah. Yeah. And it's like you said, like nobody goes to, God doesn't make anybody, though people choose. Yeah. You know, the scriptures over and over, to over talk about Romans 9, 22, vessels of wrath fitted unto destruction. Arden Gingrich says that's middle middle voice, which means uh, prepared themselves for destruction. God didn't make you like Calvinism teaches, you know, well, uh, let me accurately represent them. I think that they would say, well, you were totally depraved, but you still made the decision to sin. I would say, but you didn't have a choice to do otherwise. So they'd say, but you chose in your total depravity. So anyway, that's, I just want to, don't want to misrepresent them, but they prepared themselves for destruction. How? You had free will. You got yeah. free will. You chose sin, right? It wasn't forced on you. You chose it. Therefore, you fitted yourselves for destruction. And therefore, you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, Acts 13, 46. So if anyone goes to hell, it will be because you sinned and then God gave you the cure and you said, I'm not going to take it. Yeah. He told you ahead of time. Yeah. How to, he gave you the rules. 
You want to say, well, it's not all about rules. Well, there are rules. There are. There are. He gave you the rules. He told you the rewards for following them. He told you the punishment for not following them. And then when we didn't follow them, he said, okay, I'll give you another chance. And I'm going to keep doing that Mm -hmm. until the game is over. But when it's over, there's going to be those who follow the rules and Mm -hmm. those who didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's no shock. It shouldn't be a shock. We do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, he made us. Right. He yeah. gave us this role, this life that we have to live and things that we have to follow. And some of that, like we look to the way that he has he has handled us throughout history. We emulate that ourselves and mm-hmm. our children. God raised up the nation of Israel and he treated them certain ways. And, and in all the good ways, we recognize that and we apply that same logic to to training our children. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's and most people do that even without, you know, going much into the theology or whatever. It just is it's obvious. God's mm-hmm. going to give you certain things to do, tell you how to do it. When you don't follow it, you get what you deserve. Yeah. And I just think for anybody watching, I'm, most people that watch are probably Christians, you know, yeah. um, for people, if anyone ever watches this, not a Christian, just even if you don't believe the Bible is just go read the trial of Christ and the crucifixion. Because like, yeah. I think about how patient God is and we haven't done an episode on the trial, right? The unjust trial. I don't think we have. Uh, we, we need to do one because, and, and on the crucifixion, because it's like, I mean, the most important event in human history. But I just think about how patient God was when they arrest him in John 18 without warrants, when he just lets him arrest him. Peter pulls a sword and he's like, hey, put that away. Like, I know what I have to do. Yeah. They take him before Annas, which is illegal. They take him before Caiaphas. They spit on him. They strike him. And God doesn't unleash the armies of heaven. I know I talked about that in season one. God's in heaven like this. Like, nope, yeah. nope. And Utah, or maybe it was on the campfire stories. It was the campfire stories. And, okay, campfire stories. And you talked about the angels. That was their God too. And so they are watching this transpire when God in any time could have said, I'm going to wipe them out. They take him before Pilate. He's not guilty. Take him to Herod. They're mocking him. They're striking him. They put a crown of thorns when he goes back. They scourge him. They crucify him. And the whole time, God is being patient with mankind. saying, And Jesus, who's God and has the power to end it all like that, goes through all of that. All that because he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. Mm-hmm. All of that. Yep. And there are still people that will say, no. And I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want the cure. And there's people I know that I've read lots of writers who are like atheists and agnostics that have admitted, some of them have admitted that the reason that they don't believe in the Bible or God is because they don't want their sexual freedom restrained. And I'm telling you in America, that's my take on it. I think that most people who reject God is not because they've genuinely looked at the evidence, uh, examined it and said, I don't think it lines up. I think it's, they want to be willfully ignorant because they want sexual freedom. And I think of all the freedom, I think sexual is the one our country has the biggest problem with. Everything's sexualized. I think so. Yeah. And everything else, I mean, it tends to lead that direction. You know, if yeah. you're talking about the sin of like going out and getting intoxicated. Why? Like it, it Why do people go get drunk? Because they want to meet somebody sex. to bar that they can go sleep with. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so many things in America, everything yeah. is sexualized. I think if Social say, media. How do, okay, when you get on social media, almost 90% of the time, who has millions of followers? Yeah. It's normally public people who either, if they're men, are rich and famous and are desired by lots of people and guys want to be them and women want to be with them. Or if it's women, most of the time it's these people who, I mean, I very rarely see someone that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers that don't have half their clothes off, you know, doing TikTok dances or, or I'm a fitness model or I'm an Instagram influencer. It's like our country's so sexualized, you know, that's why you turn on TV and most of them are what pretty. Yeah. I mean, it's just my opinion. I think if you take a group of people from the United States and you, and they, and they're people who tend to want to believe the Bible, you can walk through and and they'll be like, oh, you know, I, I probably should clean up my speech. I can work on that. Mm-hmm. I probably should be a little nicer to people. I can work on that. I probably should help people who are in need. That doesn't really require them to give up something that they've grown intimately attached to. Mm-hmm. But when you start talking about, I have to, I have to stop living with the woman I've been living with for the last 15 years mm-hmm. unrighteously. Mm-hmm. Mm. Nah, I'm good. Yeah. You know, and then they walk off, they go to their thing. Well, yeah. you know, maybe this isn't the right time for me. Yeah. I've had people tell me that. Yeah. You know, this just isn't, I'm not ready to do that right now. They believe what they've just heard and read and they straight up say it. I'm not ready to do that yet. Mm-hmm. I, I, I gotta, 
I'm young or I'm this and that. And mm-hmm. I still need to go out and sow my wild oats. Mm-hmm. I don't Anyway. Even the uh, Canadian clinical psychologist, Jordan you're, Peterson. You're right is what I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm agreeing. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> I've listened to a lot of his stuff. And one of the things he's came out in the last couple of years is he, he said he couldn't um, separate the narrative and the historical proof of Jesus. Like mm-hmm. they, and he was just brought to tears by it because of just the weight that that really, that actually means. Yeah. And I just thought, so, I mean, he's a great uh, psychologist. Um, yeah. I've watched a lot of his videos, like yeah, philosopher. philosopher he, so. Yeah, man. He's hopefully I'll, somebody actually asked me recently, have you, have you, can you reach out to him? I really? said, I'll reach out to him. I have a hard time thinking I'll get through, but, but maybe yeah. if a thousand people watching this, send it to him, maybe he'll sit down and talk with us. But, but the fact that like someone to can, talk with him. Oh yeah. Like thinks like that. And then he's like, I just can't separate the historical proof and then the narrative. Yeah. And it's like, and then with that, what, if it's true, what it means. Yeah. And what see, that's, that? Uh, tons of intellectuals. That's the thing is you, in God. if you really care about going about not, let's just say the, the, the um, motivation of not going to hell, you have to be willing to look at the evidence and say, I'm going to do my best to get rid of all biases and follow the evidence wherever it leads. Because one day it's going to be real one right now. It might not be real for you right now. Oh, it's a book and I don't read it. Therefore I don't know, read it and I'm ignorant of it. And maybe it won't apply to me, but it's going to apply. And one day, you're going to stand before a judge and he's going to have be able to say, I did everything for you. I gave you every opportunity I gave you. And he may even look point to Providence and say, I introduced you to this person, this person, this person, this person, this person who invited you to church, who wanted you to have a Bible study. I showed you when you were browsing YouTube, this video, this video, this video, this video on TikTok, this video on Instagram. These are the thousand, I mean, who knows, hundreds of options I gave you to know the truth and you rejected every single one of them. And then you're going to stand there and say, I got no excuse. And Matthew 7, 21, depart from me. I never knew you. Even if you're a religious person, man, like that's scary. Yeah. And, and what there's yeah. hope. Yeah, I mean, it, there it, is yeah. hope. That's the, the, there's hope now. Yeah. There won't be then. Yeah. If you haven't obeyed the gospel. First Thessalonians four, last passage. We could just, you know, go back and forth on this all day. I know, but first Thessalonians four, Tucker just said something. There is hope. And that hope is if you get right now before the judgment day, before you die. First Thessalonians four thirteen. I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep. He's talking about the dead in Christ, right? Mm-hmm. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Yeah. So he says those people that have fallen asleep or died who are Christians, they have hope. But people who have died without Christ have what? No hope. No hope. They have no hope. <clears throat> yeah. So you've got the opportunity whenever you watch this, just take advantage of the opportunity and be willing to say, look, I'm going to follow the Bible. I'm going to follow God above my parents, above my husband or wife, above my kids, above my friends and family, above anybody. Because that's that all on judgment day, no one else can stand for you. And then when you've done that, Try mm-hmm. to convince them to. That's right. Right. Because that's right. That's, you know, you just read this for us. Mm-hmm. I think part of that sorrow is going to be the idea of that, you know, you you have. Uh, so let me rephrase that. Part of that hope is that all those that you convince, all those that you begun to know in the church, you'll get to go with them. You won't be alone. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, do your best yeah. to convince them too, because we want. That's what we want to do. We want to help everyone watching go to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the Bible, I think, teaches Christians should want to do for each other. I was going to say, like, Aaron, like that same chapter, that verse 18 of First Thessalonians 4, like, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Yeah. 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 You can comfort one another if you have hope in Christ. If you don't, you know, I said this was going to be the last one, but I apologize. I repent. I'm changing my mind. Luke 16. Luke 16, right? You have the rich man uh, and the rich man and Lazarus, right? And so if you look in verse 22 of Luke 16, the beggar, that's, that's Lazarus, uh, verse 20, the beggar died, Lazarus died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Like when you die and you're faithful and you're a child of God and you close your eyes for the last time, angels greet you and carry you to Abraham's bosom. You know, I can think of a preacher who's a buddy of mine named Jason who talked about, he was with one of his family members when they died. And I think it was his son um, Josiah, I don't know how old he was, but he said, dad, were the angels just here? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Man, my son was a young son. And he said, were the angels just here? And the dad said, I think they were son. My children 
pay attention and they pick mm-hmm. up on a lot of stuff. You know, everybody's kids does comedy kids. What yeah. They do is suck everything up. Edward, um, and I were talking about this recently. Uh, he had those questions. He, he understands that the devil walks about a, a, as a roaring lion, so mm-hmm. to speak, that he's out to try to get people. Mm-hmm. He, he knows at least that much. He doesn't comprehend that he's not like the boogeyman in his closet exactly. Yeah. But he gets that. And, and he was talking about, you know, does the devil come get you when you die or something? I was like, well, actually, you know, and I told him about, mm-hmm. you know, if you're faithful to God, the, the angels come and get you. Yeah. And they take you to yeah. where God is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just, it is an amazing thought. And that's I hope. Think it's that's hope. That even, even my child could appreciate that thought. Yeah. My three-year-old, almost four-year-old son. Yeah. Could appreciate that thought. Yeah. And that's, uh, I guess that's one of those parenting moments, but that also says something to how, true and sincere and yeah. good that hope is. Yeah. So if you die and you're faithful, that's what happens. Yeah. You're going to close your eyes for the last time. You're going to open them and angels are going to take you to Abraham's bosom. Right. Yeah. Wow. But then look at the other part of verse 22. The rich man died and was buried and being in torments. Right. That's a think a word. Pasanos is what I have written in my Bible. So it's not Tartarus like Second Peter 2, 4, but it means, uh, let's see, examination by torture. So that's what the word means in torments in Hades, right? He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. He's being comforted. And then it says this, then he cried. This is the rich man. He cried and said, father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember in your lifetime, you receive good things and likewise, uh, Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted and you are tormented. Now this is still in Hades. This isn't heaven and hell. This is still in the Hades where you have the good portion, Abraham's bosom or paradise. This is before the judgment. Tartarus, before the judgment, judgment. before the judgment, right? But look at what he says. But Abraham, son, remember you receive good things and Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted. You're tormented. Verse 26. Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So those who want to pass from here to you cannot nor can those from there pass to us. So when you die before judgment, if, if, if we all died today, right? And judgment day is however long in the future, we will go to Hades and we'll be either in, I would like to think all three of us will be in paradise and not in torments. But if you die and you're in torments, you can't cross from one side to the other. There's not this idea of purgatory. Like some people teach, like you're going to be punished for a little bit of time. Then you'll be taken to Abraham's bosom or heaven. no, there's no, there's a gulf. You can't cross to the other side. Yeah. But you, look did at, a, you did a good video on purgatory a little while back with yeah. Don, right? Answering the air. Um, I don't remember. That? Maybe. Oh, yeah. Maybe we, I'm sure we talked. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I trust you guys. <laughs> but okay, so look at verse 27. So he's in torments. He can't get out of it. He knows I'm stuck here. I'm assuming he knows he's going to be there till the judgment day. And then he's going to be Revelation 20, 15, death in Hades. Were like physical death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. So one day Hades will be destroyed when hell is basically everyone's ushered into hell. That's unfaithful. Yeah. Okay. But look at what he said. This is what he wanted. This is the, the rich man. Then he said, I beg you therefore father that you would send him, send Lazarus to my father's house. He says, please send Lazarus to tell my relatives that are still living for I have five brothers that he Lazarus may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. So he wants somebody to go back. He wants Lazarus to go back from the dead and tell his family, look, don't make the same mistake I did, right? I see all these people today that are like, oh, I died. And I can think of one guy in particular, I won't mention his name, that says he died and went to hell and he came back and he goes and preaches about all these things. And he has lots of scripture memorized, but I'm sitting there thinking, wait, so Abraham said no to this guy, but said yes to this guy. Or Paul was caught up to the third heaven, but wasn't allowed to talk about the things he saw, but this guy on YouTube is, I don't buy it. But listen, he said, verse 29. Um, yeah. Verse 28, five brothers, let him go testify to them. So they don't come to this place of torment. Like let them make a different decision than me. And Abraham Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. So at this point, they're still under the law of Moses, right? The equivalent today would be if somebody did the same thing, somebody died, let's say, you know, a guy named Joe dies and he goes and he's in torment and he asked father Abraham, please, send this other guy, send Lazarus back to my family. He'd say, look, they have the New Testament scriptures. They have the apostle. They have the words of Christ. Let them hear them. And so verse 30, and he said, no father Abraham, but if one goes back to them from the dead, they'll repent. That's what Jesus did. 
Yeah. Jesus rose from the yeah. dead. Yeah, he closes this with a with a nice burn. Neither neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. That's right. If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, so someone speaking, if 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 you could have a vision into the unseen realm today and your relative was in torment pleading for somebody to go back to you, you should hear Abraham say to you, if they don't hear the New Testament, if they don't hear the words of Christ and the apostles, if they don't hear the gospel, the New Testament faith, neither will they be persuaded that one rise from the dead. And you have, Jesus did rise from the dead. And people that had saw, I was, I can't remember who I was talking about this recently, my buddy Christian, but we were talking about people who were at the cross, they had all, I mean, some of them have seen miracles. They saw yeah. what Jesus did. Yeah. And like we think today, oh, if miracles, if we saw them, then we would believe. But they did. And then they chose not to, they let him die. Yeah. Only the ones who would hear Moses and the prophets were the ones who became faithful disciples, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all the religious leaders who claim to have known Moses and the prophets, but they added in this and that. They mm -hmm. had their power tied up in it. Mm -hmm. They didn't really listen to Moses and the prophets. No. So they weren't ever persuaded, even when Christ resurrected. Mm -hmm. You talked about people wanting to see miracles. In Matthew 12, 38, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. That word sign, I think it's like S-E-M-A-I-N-O-S or something in Greek, mm -hmm. which is a miracle. We want to see a miracle. He answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, seeks after a miracle. No sign will be given to it, that generation, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So he basically says to these people that say, well, I want to see a miracle. He says, I'm not going to show you a miracle, but there is going to be a miracle that you need to see and recognize. And that's going to be the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. So people today that say, well, I'd believe if God showed me a miracle. No, you probably wouldn't. And God's already done the only miracle he needs to prove it to you. And that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. We don't want anybody to go to hell. No. We, we have a duty to each other to keep each other from going there. If one of us starts to stray, our job is to yank the other back, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing for members of the church. If you have people that you know that have left the church, reach out to them. And for those of you who aren't sure whether you're doing what the Bible needs, the Bible instructs you to do, if you need help, reach out to us. You know our email, authenticchristianpodcast at gmail.com. I'm sorry, it's not shorter, but you can take the time, pause the video and spell it out right. But reach out to us. We'd love to help you check with uh, the scriptures, whether you did what the Bible says to do. We have lots of videos about that. Season one, episodes eight and nine is how to become a Christian mm -hmm. and some of the objections people have to what we teach about what the scriptures say, how to become a Christian. Reach out. We can help you find a local church. Um, Matt Wallen from House to House, Heart to Heart and yep. Keith Kasarjan from Bear Valley help us find people, find congregations all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Great guys. Yeah. Great guys that don't work with us. They don't, we don't, they don't get paid by us. And yet they still, you know, work their tails off to find people all over the world. I mean the world, not just the U S Oh yeah. There's, but the whole world Yeah, um, to find congregations that if you're watching, you can worship with that's following the new Testament. So we don't want anybody to go to hell. We want to go to heaven and take as many people uh, as we can with us. So thanks for hanging with us. It's been a long episode, almost an hour. But um, it's an important topic, yeah. and it's not easy to talk about, but it's a topic that everybody needs to know about because everyone is going to stand before the judgment seat. Yeah, so, yeah it's on Christ. the line for everyone. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Really appreciate all the time you guys take to spend with us, and we'll catch you back on the next episode of the Authentic Christian Podcast. Have a good day.